If you clicked on this video, you're likely a fan of the RPG genre. And even if you aren't, you probably still know a lot about them. In fact, you probably already know about the granddaddy of all modern role-playing games, Dungeons and Dragons. Challenge your imagination to come alive and to battle with the creatures of Dungeons and Dragons. That's because in recent years, the RPG has been killing it in pretty much every way possible. Games like Witcher 3 have sold like crazy, while games like Disco Elysium have become incredible critical darlings. Subgenres haven't just bloomed, but flirted and cross-pollinated so much that it feels like nearly every game has RPG elements in them, and every RPG has elements from other games. Got my comeuppance now. Less moaning, more details. What happened, and how can I help? And remember, I don't work for free. Even if you turned away from the monitor entirely, the role-playing game is having a tabletop renaissance. The fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons has made the game infinitely more accessible and more popular in other cultures as well. You, how do you want to do this? Yeah! Yeah! So, if we all know the RPG guided start in 1974 with Gary Gygax, Steve Arneson, and D&D, then that's it, right? Nothing more to talk about. Well, not quite. While Dungeons and Dragons created the structure that would birth the RPG, there was another structure which birthed D&D, the war game. War games have been around for centuries. The ancient Indian game of Chaturanga, the ancient Chinese game of Lubo, the long-standing games of Chess and Go. These games were ultimately just strategy games. They had next to no role-playing in them. Curiously, the war games wouldn't really become the RPG until you introduce it to staunch anti-war authors and massive influences in the world of the sci-fi and fantasy. The war game ironically became commercialized by the renowned pacifist and sci-fi author H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells loathed war in real life, but he saw in toy battle simulations a chance to make violence toothless. He created the world's first easy and accessible rulebook for war gaming, titled Little Wars. H.G. Wells was building off an established genre called Kriegspiel, which the Prussian army made because Prussia loved actual war, and they wanted to get better at it by simulating wars when they weren't actually fighting one. H.G. Wells wrote Little Wars to turn practice into playtime. How much better is this amiable miniature war, H.G. Wells wrote, than the real thing. Wells' books was interesting because, in a sense, it encouraged roleplay and was designed with imaginative youngsters in mind, even speaking from the perspective of an imaginary little general. Little Wars would inspire wargaming as a whole and Gygax and Anderson directly. Gygax and Anderson's earliest games would become medieval war games like Chainmail. If Little Wars put down some roots for role-playing in wargaming, then J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings watered those roots. Lord of the Rings was published in the 50s but experienced ever-mounting popularity in the 60s as it went to paperback and The Hobbit became a film. Thorin is correct, I simply do not understand war. Lord of the Rings would birth what we know as the Western fantasy genre and created so many ideas core to the RPG. Races like halflings, dwarves, elves, and orcs. Classes like rogues, fighters, and wizards, magical items of great power and curse. And of course, the Fellowship, the band of special heroes capable of saving the world. Dungeons and Dragons came from bringing the fantasy mythos created by Lord of the Rings into the mechanical world of the war game. Now, nearly every fantasy RPG takes some place of the lore or design from Tolkien. As these two godfathers of speculative fiction inspired D&D, so D&D inspired many young computer scientists and programmers. As computers grew into a new technological frontier in the 70s, the RPG moved from the tabletop to the monitor. It started off with bored and adventurous university students working on the cumbersome mainframes of the mid-70s. Some of the games ended up lost to time, deleted for space on the very big but not very powerful computers of the day. But we do know some of the progenitors like Great Cave Adventure. Great Cave Adventure was one of the many text-based adventure games made in the mid-70s. These text-based games often lack save features and work through entering one or two word commands. And yet, university students loved them because they had things that you need in an RPG. Story, risk, progression, treasure, and all that good stuff. If these games weren't text-based then, then they were Dungeon Simulators, the predecessor of the Dungeon Crawler. Pettit 5 and Moria were the founders of the Dungeon Crawler, masking simple combat systems and graphics onto the early systems of the day. These Dungeon Crawlers would also be the earliest precursors of the MMORPGs. Well, depending on how you define massively, part of the massively multiplayer online. Since these games were built on an old interconnected network, 
they often had multiplayer online capacity, just to a much smaller extent. There was a proto-MMO genre called MUD, or multi-user dungeon, where multiple users could join a dungeon crawl. These games arrived as early as the late 70s with titles such as Zork and, well, Mud the game that the genre was named after. These 70s dungeon crawlers and text-based games would create a classic RPG as well. The one where you and your enemy take turns striking back and forth. One built off of what's called action economy in D&D. This is where each side has a certain amount of actions that they can take in a turn before the enemy moves. Your action economy can become stronger and more efficient with levels and progression. Computers weren't just good for storing and running numbers either. Notably, computers could randomize much more efficiently than people, which was great news for the RPG. The random encounter had been a feature of tabletop RPGs, but the computer could randomize more quickly and smoothly than the human, which allowed for great games like Rogue. Rogue was a 1980 computer game which was made in ASCII, which are those big blocks of text symbols made to resemble other things. Rogue's graphics left a lot up to the imagination, but it honed the random encounter into an exciting, deadly, constantly randomizing dungeon where one's death could reset everything. And so, the roguelike was born. The visuals of the RPG would begin to come to life a year later with Richard Garriott's own Akalabeth, World of Doom. A teenager at the time, Garriott's coded a game himself and made it entirely in first person, using wireframes. This was a big feat at the time because it did something tabletop D&D couldn't do. It lets you see through the eyes of your own adventurer. The Calibeth would turn into an even more influential series called Ultima. Ultima would help pioneer the tiled overworld map, along with games like Adventure. Gary would also make innovation core to the Ultimate series, which we'll be talking about later on in this video. In 1984, those open maps would blossom into what considered as the first true open world experience and sandbox RPG, Elite. Elite saw the RPG returning to its sci-fi origins, allowing the player to explore the final frontier as a lightly armed trading ship. The subgenre would further solidify with games like Wasteland, which would turn into Fallout. Oh, it's you again. Are you gonna get me out? Hello? Anybody home? Could you get me out of here? Could you get me out of here? In the 80s, the RPG would experience two other massive developments as well, the rise of the A and the JRPG. In the 80s, Japan and the US had an incredible amount of cultural exchange. Within that exchange, Japan's own programmers were learning of the RPGs made in the US. They would try to emulate this with their own Japanese RPGs or JRPGs. One of the earliest and most popular of these was Dragon Quest, although it wasn't alone. The Legend of Zelda and Final Fantasy both debuted as well in the 80s. The JRPG became its own subgenre as much due to their aesthetics and culture as well as mechanics. The JRPG did share key influences with Western RPG like D&D and even Tolkien. However, the JRPG had other Japanese cultural touchstones which radically shifted the stories that these games were telling, and the art that they created. Both Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest would employ manga artists to create their art. Dragon Quest was even worked in close concert with the Shonen Jump and employed the artists behind Dragon Ball. This lent these games to a unique feel, a more distinct one from the world of the elves and the orcs. I mean, look at this. You're just not going to find dancing cat chefs in Western RPG. Even when the JRPGs do employ elves, like say Legend of Zelda, they don't feel the need to make it the same elves as Dragon Age, The Elder Scrolls, or D&D. JRPGs employ more elements of both the new and traditional Japanese culture, whether it be colorful and cute anime designs, or cute cultural pieces from historical Japan, like hot spas or traditional clothes and armor. JRPGs would also market much more heavily towards consoles, shaping the way that these games were developed and the audience that they reached. This desire to move things on a console and to capture a younger audience also pushed early JRPGs like Legend of Zelda into being action RPGs or ARPGs. The action RPG takes the classes, the progression, the world, and the story of the classic RPGs and puts it in real time. No more turns, less menus, and more action. In fact, for a long time, most popular gaming histories counted the Japanese game Dragon Slayer as their first ever ARPG. However, thanks to some incredible research by Samuel Messner, we now know that Dragon Slayer itself was inspired by a game that let you choose between real-time and turn-based combat. Caverns of Frayed Tag was another Apple II game made by another member of the Ultima team. This game was remarkable because technically, while it was turn-based, there was a timer that you could set. If you didn't act by the end of the timer, the enemy would. At its slowest, the game was basically turn-based, and at its fastest, it was basically real-time. Caverns of Free Tag directly inspired Dragon Slayer, which inspired Zelda and many other ARPGs to come. I almost forgot, 
After saving the Triforce from evil, the hero gets his reward. Ow! Don't you ever whistle at me again! I may never whistle again, However, Japan's RPGs weren't all speed and sword swings. The region also pioneered the tactical or strategic RPG. The tactical RPG was a return to the D&D roots, with combat playing out in phases where players could move their characters on square grids and attack enemies. When the enemy's phase arrived, they would attack. The ancestor to the subgenre is possibly the first JRPG, The Dragon and the Princess. In this game, players could search an overworld map through commands, and when they entered combat, things would zoom into a top-down grid map. The battle grid format would get reused by Ultima 3, and then it would really take off and return fully to its own subgenre in 1990 with the release of Fire Emblem. Over in the US, the mid-80s and 90s would see the MUD turn into the MMO. The first bridge from the MUD to the MMO was probably the island of Kismai. This is the Island of Kismai, a Dungeons and Dragons type of game, and Michael Orkin, a statistician who's designed and played his share of games, is playing it for the first time with two other people 2,000 miles away in real time via the CompuServe network. Two other people, 2,000 miles away. Incredible. But in all seriousness, Kismai was what the earliest days of MMO looked like. It put the text of the ASCII element and the MUD inside the burgeoning structure of the early internet. Kismai would also have staples of massively multiplayer games like chat, PvP, and cooperative play. It was followed by Habitat in 1986, a game with no combat but with a lot more users and role-playing. In 1991, Neverwinter Nights would be the first MMO to actually sort of look like an MMO. It would also be the first MMO that was less of an experiment and more of a feasible experience. Early MMOs were often playable at certain times when the servers were up, and even when they were, they cost a lot to play. For example, Habitat cost $12 an hour to play in 1986 which, if you adjust for inflation, is nearly $30 an hour today. 1991's Neverwinter Nights initially cost $6 an hour and ran on America Online, opening it to a wider audience. The MMORPG would really truly soar with Ultima Online. In fact, Ultima's Richard Garriott would be the first one to popularize the term MMO. Ultima Online had better graphics, gameplay, and was even more cost-efficient with the flat $9.95 a month subscription costs. This was still quite expensive, but way more doable. The game would reach 250,000 subscribers, which may seem pretty tiny, but that only speaks to how hugely successful the MMORPG would become, as games like EverQuest and World of Warcraft would there be released. There are million people in the world of Warcraft because Chuck Norris allows them to live. I'm Chuck Norris, and I approve this game. With the MMO's fellowship beginning, we now come to the end of the origin point for the RPG. As the RPG moves forward, we see lines of these subgenres begin to blur together. Fire Emblem, once a pure tactical RPG, now has traditional RPG systems, more intensive dialogue choices, and a quasi-open map, odd bits of multiplayer connectivity, and an incredible dating simulator. Anyway, Monster Hunter, once a JRPG, is now a Japanese massively multiplayer online action role-playing game. <laughs> Mouthful. You know, the classic JMMOARPG. As the RPG grows, these genre lines become way less defined. Roguelikes become roguelites, and even non-RPG games take on some RPG elements. The entire genre is approaching a nearly unnameable stew of different subgenre elements. But in a way, this is all in keeping with the spirit of the genre. We look at the RPG and we see a genre in many ways still deeply in touch with its roots. Not because it looks the same, but actually because it looks kind of different. Born from fusing together cultural touchstones, the RPG only continues its quest of drawing more meaningful pieces together. The one small fellowship grows larger and larger, taking in more elements of our world so it can become even better at creating new ones. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you want to see more of me, you can follow me on my Instagram and unfortunately TikTok at Nathan underscore ING. With all that being said, hope I see you in the next one. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day. Peace.